This will help me God. Notice the president was the first guy to wave because he doesn't like guys named Bubba in a cell with him, okay? It is what it is. All right, well, that's being silly, but none of that. But read that thing because there's a lot we capture in that. We get the patient on record saying that they get the payment directly to pay us. We get the patient on record saying they got that HIPAA notice, okay? We get the patient on record saying that it's okay for us to appeal a claim if the insurance decides to deny it. So there's a whole lot packed in that little paragraph that we need to get a signature. Now, we all know there are times when you're unable to get that signature, okay? In that event, the feds allow for us to get a representative signature. And it's explained in there. However, you must explain on the form and then tie that to your patient care report why the patient was physically or mentally unable to sign in your estimation, okay? So you'll see there's a section there. Patient could not sign due to. Then you would write in full mobilization. Patient was unconscious, altered mental status, in cardiac arrest, okay? Whatever the case may be, explain it. Then you may have a representative of the patient, family member, spouse, next of kin, neighbor, somebody that will sign. And that doesn't mean they're taking financial responsibility for that mm. patient. It's saying that if that patient were able to, they would reasonably sign on their own. They're attesting to that fact, okay? So first choice is obviously patient. Second choice is a rep. And then you have plan Z. And section three, let me tell you, should be reserved when all else fails, all right? Because they'll audit for these and they'll look for them. See that you guys aren't getting signatures and using section three, and they're going to ding you for that, all right? They'll ask for their money back is what they'll do. And oh, by the way, how about paying this interest for all the time you had our money and you didn't cough it up? So what we want you to do in that section is you have no other option. Patient's not able to sign. There's nobody around that's willing to sign for him or, or is able. Then you or your partner, whoever's on that crew, can sign that form, and again, you must tell on that form and in your trip sheet why the patient was unable to sign. And then you get a couple things to back that up. Either a hospital face sheet from the hospital with the time and day stamp that you presented the patient, or you get somebody at the ER or at the facility you're transporting to to sign off and agree with you that the patient was unable to sign. Now, the trick is about section three, is it's only good for that transport. The other two are good for lifetime, all right? But don't rely on the fact that maybe somebody got it. Know that you have a signature before you move on. If you didn't get a signature yesterday, then don't assume that the other crew got it yesterday, okay? But you do have that option in section three to sign and say, patient wasn't able, there was no one else around, then you get somebody at ER to sign and agree with you, or you attach the face sheet from the hospital, from the ER, and then that so backs we it up. Know that we have some frequent flyers. We know that we already have one on file. We do not have you can write file. SOF on that form and signature on file, as long as I either have it from past or you have it somewhere here that I can grab it if I need it. If they audit and they want to produce it, we've got to be able to produce the signature. So if you sent it down mm -hmm. in a trip previously, mm -hmm. then I have it on file and you know that, then you can write signature on file and that's what we'll use. So it's safer to get it. It is safer to just go out and get it every time. Yep. No guesswork. You got it. Does it really hurt anything? Probably not. Okay? Questions about signatures? All right. We've blown through this pretty good. Mr. President, I'll have you out of here by at least midnight. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's move on. Let's talk about writing subjective narratives. Um, the first thing that you're going to do in order to write a good narrative, folks, is take good notes in the field. You know, on days when you're busy and you got back-to-back -back calls, you got to remember call A versus call B, and the only way you're going to do that is if you have a good note system, right? I don't think I have to tell too many people in this room that because I look around, there's, there's not a lot of newbies, uh, but it, it's common sense. Carry something with you that you can take notes in the field, and then you got it covered. And think beyond that computer program. Everybody gets lost in the fact, well, if I click this field, I click that field. i got to tell you, it's all in the writing of your narrative. All that data element stuff, goes to the county, it goes to the region, it goes to the state. You can get statistics on that. When a Medicare reviewer comes around or an insurance reviewer, they want to read the story, okay? And the recent, today's uh, communication from Medicare, use these words, paint a picture in words about your trip. That's their direction to us. So obviously, they're not saying, we'll look at all those little data elements. What are they saying? We're gonna look at that paragraph or two that you write about your, about your trip. 
So it's going to become even more important that you, you do good subjective narratives, okay? Here's what Medicare says they'll pay. They will cover ambulance services only if it's furnished to a beneficiary whose medical condition at the time of transport is such that transportation by any other means would endanger the patient's health. And you can read the rest of that paragraph. But their first sentence there is pretty stark. They don't care. The person calls 911 and you get there and they're being stupid. They don't want to pay for them. All right? So it's going to be up to you guys to explain to us why you feel and why the patient felt he or she needed an ambulance. However, there may be times when you get dispatched and you get there and there isn't a good reason. And those trips may not get paid by Medicare we may have to go after the patient to pay that, okay? Uh, and, and those scenarios come up all the time. Those people that meet you on the street with their bags packed because they want to be first in line for their MRI that day. And we've mm -hmm. all had that. Or they got a hangnail, you know? Or, you know, whatever the case would be. I'm not even going to, because of 26 years, I've seen just about everything, just like all you guys have, you know? People abuse the system, no doubt about it. It's an easy way to go. I don't have a car. I got to get to the hospital because I feel I'm... I'm just going to die, and they're nowhere close to death any more than you and I are. But nonetheless, we've got to go out and do the job. But when you write it up, be as uh, uh, careful to write it up as possible, giving us all the details so we can determine whether or not it was medically necessary. Okay? Yes, sir? So you're saying, if I'm getting what you're saying, if that patient didn't need the BLS ambulance to take them in, we just ate that whole call. Well, you didn't eat it, bud. But what you can do is if it's not medically necessary, you can bill it to the patient direct. So, no, you don't eat it because we'll still go after and collect whatever we can. But you do that. Right? That's correct. Yeah, you don't have to worry about that. What I need from you is a truthful picture of that incident. Good, bad, or indifferent. Be truthful. Okay? I'm not looking for you to fudge. I'm not looking to try to make something out of it. What is it? We'll talk about that in some slides. But I'm being honest with you <coughs> that not all 911s <coughs> are medically necessary in the eyes of the, of the uh, Medicare carrier. And now we see that guidance today being even more clear than ever. All right, because they're pretty, pretty upfront with that. Yes, sir? Can you say that to the patient on the streets that in our judgment? Um, yeah, well, I think you're holding yourself for liability. Yeah, yeah, right? you, you know, really, you know, <laughs> payment rules and response rules for the state are two different things. Um, quite frankly, when they, when they drop the tones and you guys go, you got to transport, okay? And, and they got to tell you they don't want to be transported before you start refusing. I mean, they can refuse you. You pretty much can't refuse that. So you dispatch and you go and you transport, <clears throat> and then we sift it all out later. <clears throat> I think you'd watch. You know, I would be careful with that because I think you can run into the a situation. Sets us up to eat it, 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 it does, unfortunately. And I'll tell you folks, we will do everything, everything we can to get every last penny out of that trip. But it is what it is. And if somebody decides to be play games with the system, then you know we're kind of stuck with what we're handed. But that's why I'm asking you to be as detailed as possible in your explanations. The day is gone when you can write Dispatched, arrived on scene, placed patient on stretcher, and transported to the hospital without a whole lot else in between. And I still read a lot of trips like that. I'm not saying from here. I'm talking about 160 clients in you know 10 different states. Um, it is what it is, folks. But you are really disservicing your station and yourself, setting yourself up for liability if you're not telling a truthful, uh, detailed picture about that run that you're doing. Okay, so be careful about that. But when we get it, we'll have to make a determination and just understand that we're doing everything in our power to get it paid, but there may just be some situations that we're not able to overcome because it was what it was. Okay? And then if we look at medical necessity now, here's what they base it on. Ambulance transportation is covered when the patient's condition requires the vehicle itself and or the specialized services of the trained ambulance personnel. A requirement of coverage is that the needed services of the ambulance personnel were provided and clear clinical documentation in the patient's medical record validates their medical need. The patient's condition as well as changes in that condition and the treatment provided must be in the record of the ambulance service. 
So now you're making sure that you document everything about that incident and how you treat it. Because what they'll do is, you know, they kind of throw this up against a wall and see if it sticks. And the way it sticks is when they clinically can prove that there was a need for an ambulance to go out there and treat that patient. And if that ambulance hadn't responded, their life may have been in jeopardy. Okay? So we, and, and this goes for emergencies or non-emergencies. Inner facilities are the same, meet the same medical necessity rules. In fact, it's even more difficult. I actually will tell you that I'd love to see you write a novel about all your routines because a lot of times those are the ones that the reviewers will come to look at because they're very skeptical that if a patient is in a hospital, why couldn't they have stayed there and been treated properly? So the onus is on you guys to tell us and tell them why that patient had to leave Wellsboro Hospital and go to Packer or go to down to Williamsport or whatever the case. What's not available? Who's not available? What treatment did they need at Hospital B that they couldn't get at Hospital A? Okay, and that is your burden of proof within your documentation to list. Okay, that's where we run into more scenarios than even the 911s. There's a few 911s, but they're limited. We now, it, we, the issue is, is the inner facilities, and that's where we run into some, some difficulties. Okay? Doesn't, uh, physician medical necessity yes, it does, but that is only <clears throat> a piece of the puzzle. Your documentation actually blows that PCS right out of the water if it doesn't coincide. So, it, you know, if you uh, arrive at the hospital and they give you a patient's medical necessity and it says a patient's bed bound and you find them sitting in a chair, that PCS just went right out the window. I had that happen to me a couple months ago at an inner facility out of Burke Hospital going to a nursing home. Walk in, they handed me a PCS, I looked at it and it said patient's bed bound. There he sat in a wheelchair. I turned to the nurse, I said, I need another uh, medical necessity form. She said, why, Chuck? I said, because this one won't hold any water. Well, why not? I said, you're saying the patient's bed bound, right? Yeah. I said, he's sitting in a chair. Oh, well, he's in a wheelchair. I said, wheelchair is a chair. He cannot sit in a chair and be bed bound. Now, tell me another reason why he needs to go. Well, then what she coughed up was, is that because of his demented state, he has tried to elope on them, and if he were in a wheelchair in a wheelchair van, he'd probably try to kick the daylights out of one of us and elope while we're on our way to Nanico. Okay, I don't want him in the back of my wheelchair van. He needs an ambulance. Now go get another PCS and explain that. And then that's what she did. Brought it back, trip flow, flew it out of prop. Okay. So your documentation override. What, what a lot of people think of is we look at that medical necessity because the doc signs off on a lot of times as a prescription. There's no prescription for ambulance service. Your documentation tells the story at the time. It actually blows that other thing right out of the water. If you have to scratch your head and wonder why that patient's going before you put them in your ambulance, make sure that you determine why he needs to go and be succinct about that. Okay.